said the signifying monkey to the lion one day, Hey, hey, there's someone going around talking, I'm sorry to say, about your mama in a scandalous way. The lion looked up in surprise and said, Wait, wait a minute, wait, who is this? Who's, who's saying what? I said, there's somebody going around talking about your mama. Oh, oh, that's you, monkey. The lion looked up in surprise and said, you know, you better stop talking the way you're talking, or else you're going to get something. Well, what he said about your mama made me mad. The lion became infuriated, thinking that somebody was talking about his mama. He shot off through the jungle like the shot from a 44. You're going to find the elephant. Even the score, that's who the monkey had told him was talking about his mama. Mm -hmm. He found the elephant where the tall grass grows and he began to circle around him. He's going to punch him in the nose. The elephant looked up in surprise and said, <laughs> Wait a minute, lion, wait a minute. You better go and pick on somebody your size. But the lion wouldn't listen. The lion wouldn't listen. He made a pass. The elephant grabbed him up in his trunk and threw him down on, on the grass. He beat his head to a fairly well. Wop, 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 wop. Finally, the lion dragged off more dead than alive. And this is when the monkey up in the tree started some more of the signifying giant. <laughs> Look at you. Man, he beat your head through a fatty well. You're supposed to be king of the jungle. Ain't that some stuff? He beat you up and then you had enough. The monkey got to laugh and it jumped up and down and his foot missed the limb and he plunged to the ground. The lion jumped on it with all four feet. He was going to bring his body to hamburger meat. But we know how curious cats are, right? You know how curious cats are. Mm -hmm. The monkey got the butt. So, oh, oh, please, please, Mr. Lion, please let me go. I'll tell you something you really ought to know. The lion lifted up his paw and the monkey scampered up to you and got away. He said, What I want to tell you? If you didn't fool with me, I get my friend the elf on you again. The lion looked up and roared. No. Let me do that again. Ooh. I've been listening to the records about it. Mm -hmm. okay. Listen to here, me, Marky. Up in them trees, man, you better stay. And that's where they are to this very day. This is true. Now, you know, good afternoon. My name is Odie Hawkins, and uh, good afternoon. I had the little piece of. Uh, stuff in my head from thinking about uh, Oscar Brown Jr. who was a very great poet and a songwriter uh, from my place, from Chicago. And occasionally I think about uh, some of the works he did and they were so down to earth and so matter of fact, you know, uh, he came up with this song called Friday. You know, when people got paid, today is Friday, I got my check tonight, it's Friday. Blah, blah, blah. And I thought it would make a, I don't know, sort of a nice little prologue, prologue <clears throat> for the reading I'm about to continue to do from the columns I wrote for the African Times newspaper. The column was called Africa Media Watch, and I wrote for two years, and I tried to include a, as much as the... Oscar Brownisms as I could, and so I thought that would make a, you know, a kind of a, kind of a prologue of an opening. So that's what I did. Okay. So, having said that, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> my producer, Senora Zola Selena Hawkins herself, yeah. is shaking her, her fist at me, saying, "On with the show." On with the show. <laughs> she may have sounded kind of mild back then, but she's, she's wicked, but she wants to have her own way. Ah. But first, a little pomegranate juice. Oh, boy, it's good. This particular column, 
deals with something that happens that happened at the uh, the the games, the Olympic Games uh, in Atlanta in 1996. And uh, well, here's what happened. I call it the color game at the Atlanta Olympics. I watched snips and bits of the Olympic Games, Los Angeles and, Cal and Chicago. I missed the evening ceremony live, but caught it later via VCR, the night after they had that wonderful party at the conclusion of all the events. As an ex-amateur boxer, I found myself quivering with pride as I watched the inimitable, the inimitable Muhammad Ali light the Olympics flame. You remember that? Yes, I do. My ambivalence about the art of boxing was shaped in the ring, ducking and dodging the sledgehammer hooks and jabs of Muhammad Ali's monstrous foes, Fraser, Norton, Doug Jones, Cleveland Williams, Archie, Mongoose Moore, Foreman. My ambivalence toward the art is sharpened by the memory of the immortal Sugar Ray Robinson and the sight of the present day Muhammad Ali. He was still alive when I wrote this. Why was the brief ceremony awarding the great Muhammad Ali another gold medal for the one he lost or threw away upon returning to racism in America, depending on your info source, held at halftime during the basketball game between the Yugoslavians and the Dream Team? Why did he why did he just squeeze it in there? Why wasn't the business done before? during or one of the back boxing matches, any one of them. Oh well. The games were going well. Great catalyst for enormous consumption of beer and speculation until that devastating phone call came at, on July 27th. The bombing, the injuries, the deaths suddenly frosted the red-hot competition. We were immediately reminded of genocide in Rwanda, Burundi, the Bosnian horrors, Ireland, church bombers in America, dictatorial escapades in Nigeria, human rights violations in China, the Arab-Israeli violations conundrum, the casual slaughter of people in Colombia, Haiti, Somalia, Iraq, South Africa, facts of life on planet Earth, 1996. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, amazingly, the voice that made the phone call warning the people in Senior Park, Centennial Park that a bomb was going to explode was identified by the print slash visual media as that of a white male. Unfortunately, they couldn't give us his height, weight, eye color, or hair length based on the strength of their deduction. A, late, a day later, in an Olympian rush to judgment, a pudgy security guard who lives with his mommy was practically convicted by most of the major newspaper and television broadcasters in the country. The evidence needed to incriminate the man was lacking, but that didn't prevent the fickle fingers from being pointed in his direction. It was announced on an hourly basis at times that he was being questioned by the FBI. Now then, as most American citizens know, being questioned by the FBI means that you are almost guilty. If the man was found completely guilty, I don't think it would take a dream team to have an honest jury exonerate him based on the principle that you can't try a person twice for the same offense. The media had already hung him once. Mm -hmm. Americans and effervescent people returned to the games with renewed vigor and interest after the debris settled. And the games went on and on and on. In Chicago, I was called from a sound sleep by a nephew with a Richard Pryor-like sense of humor. Hey, uncle, come and check this out. The Eurocentrics are at it again. So at 2 a.m. on a moonlit Middle Western night, we sat and compared lengths of a startlingly pale collection of anorexic ballerina type from Bulgaria, Bielorussia, Transylvania, Bergenstein, and a few other incredibly named places who knew how to do marvelously 
gymnastic stuff with small beach balls, juggling mallets and swirling ribbons. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, my grandson, Brian, informed us of a new system of medal counting. Well, we won all three of those medals. Huh? Are you sure? Looks like the U.S. only won gold, first place. Yeah, but Antigua and Chad won second, silver, and third, bronze. Hmm. People were looking at the Olympics like... It would be emotional fraud to suggest that we were disappointed with his Pan-African scorekeeper. I suspect most of us were doing the same thing subconsciously. How many of us were left unmoved by the rapid, rippling, glistening thighs of the American women's 400 meters relay team? And the sun glinting off of their ear earrings and the gold circling their lovely dark throats. The intricately designed hairstyles, the natty dreads, the healthy gleams in their eyes. And was it my imagination? Or did my niece's potato chip bag rustle a bit more urgently when the African-American male sprinters pulled their undershirts off at the end of their swift trips to the finish line? Mmm. That brother got stomach like a, looked like a washboard. You got that right. Why did my 87-year-old aunt withhold her applause for the Moroccan 1,500-meter magician? He hasn't lost since 1989, until we assured her that Morocco was in Africa. And was Michael Johnson doing a cakewalk or what? On his way to a new world record in his golden slippers. I suspected a good deal of racial chauvinism lapped at the fringes of most of the track and field events, which were probably unavoidable, given the number of times athletes swathed themselves in the national colors after winning the gold. Oddly, I never saw the silver or bronze medal athletes snatch a flag and trot around with it. Perhaps they had already conceded their potential endorsers to the alpha heroes. The U.S. women's basketball team iced the scene with an emotional or gripping defeat of Brazil. But the icing on the cake had to be the Nigerian win in soccer. It might be compared to what would have happened if the Yugoslavians had beaten the dream team. That is, of course, an extreme scenario, but you get the picture. Unfortunately, for some bizarre reason, the Nigerian-Brazilian contest was not televised. No one seemed to know why. I suspect it may have had something to do with racial politics. As we all know, Brazil, after Nigeria, has the largest number of people of African descent in the New World. Who would be interested in seeing two major league centers of African culture play soccer? Once again, special interest group action determines what we will be exposed to. Mm -hmm. Aside from the media hype telling us in excellent details why our heroes and sheroes should be, have you ever really given any serious thought to the matter? I was forced to concern myself with the idea by a casual question. My grandson Brian asked me, who is your hero, your own special hero? It was obvious he was probing for more than a popular name. Jim Brown, Joe Lewis, Pele, Sugar Ray Robinson, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, Sports, John Hope Franklin, Ivan Van Sertema, John Henry Clark, Historians, Harriet Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer, Njinga, Rosa Parks, Warriors, John Otterbridge, Cedric Adams, Charles White, Margaret Burroughs, Yes, I said Cedric Adams, Margaret Burroughs, DJ Robinson, Willie Middlebrook, Cynthia St. James, artists. Richard Wright, Zora Neil Hurston, James Baldwin, Sapphire, Phyllis Wheatley, Walter Soyanka, Louise Merriweather, Alex Haley, writers. 
Melba Liston, Valeda Snow, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, Horace Tapscott, John Coltrane, Armando Parata, Sir Vaughn, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Charlie Parker, Rabbi Shankar, Kids, King Sonny Ade, Bob Marley, Milton Nascimento, Musicians, MD, Richard Dado, O. Solomon, The Watch Prophets, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Esther Oklu, Marat Margani, Fela Sekutore, Maxine Waters, social activists. Hundreds of names popped in my mind, but there was one that grabbed me from a, a dreamless sleep. From a dreamless sleep, baby. Could mean, could mean I couldn't sleep. Mm -mm. Means I couldn't dream while I was trying to sleep. Oh, you know what I'm finding. Yeah. Henry Box Brown. Mm -hmm. I stumbled across Henry Box Brown's story years ago, searching for something else, a case of pure serendipity. There is no record of Henry Box Brown's birth date, or nor was there a day devoted to his memory, although I think there should be. Henry Brown's story starts, begins, for our, for our purposes, in March 1858, when he made a decision to run away from a life of slavery in Richmond, Virginia. Legally, illegally, he belonged to one man who hired him out to another man, a tobacco warehouse owner. Henry's wages, whatever they were, were paid to his legal owner, and Henry had to hustle, feed, clothe, and house himself. Himself. If there was ever an area between a rock and a hard place, Henry Brown was there. Somehow, over the years, he had managed to save $166, a small fortune for the time. He took this money to a small shopkeeper who had voiced sympathetic comments about his conditions and begged the man to help him flee from chattel slavery. The shopkeeper, obviously a supporter of affirmative action, agreed to help Brown escape for a price. Brown paid him half of his cash to Help. Bam, 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 bam. Now the problem of what to do and how to do it faced them. They both knew the penalties for engaging in the illegal activity of trying to free human beings. The shopkeeper could be fined, forced to pay the escaped slave owners for loss of his property, and of course, he would be ostracized by his peers. A weaker lover. The would-be escapee from slavery would be, could be legally murdered for fleeing. He could receive a hundred lashes with a bullhide whip. He could have an R for runaway branded on his face. Right here. Mm -hmm. He could, he could, he could have a, a foot or a hand chopped off. Or he could be shackled and leg guys for life. Henry Brown and his accomplice puzzled over a number of plans, but each of them was flawed. Henry Brown thought of the box. We can be certain that it wasn't a frivolous session of brainstorming that produced the idea. A wooden box that would become his coffin ride to freedom. The shop owner wrote a letter to three friends in Philadelphia, the destination for Henry's box, who just happened to be red hot abolitionists. The trio agreed to receive Henry when he arrived. The plan moved to other levels. Henry had a friend, a friend, a fellow slave named, ironically, Moses, <laughs> who worked in a carpentry shop, had him build a box. The exact dimensions of the box had been lost or simply misplaced, but we can assume that it was a tight fit. It doesn't take a great imagination to feel what this man must have felt being nailed into his vehicle. Curious, I had a box built to test the emotion that surfaced inside that kind of pressure. I urgently requested freedom after exactly four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes. Henry was taken by a horse drawn cart to the train station in Richmond, loaded in the freight section unloaded and reloaded on the freight crossing the Potomac to Washington, D.C., 
and reloaded on the train that finally deposited him in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm. Mm -hmm. It took me many hours to finish the brief story of Henry Brown's sojourn to freedom. I spent many more hours thinking and suffering through the agonies he must have experienced during the course of his 35-hour trip. There are no words yet designed to reconstruct the mental states he must have gone through. Certainly, he must have wandered through several forms of insanity during the course of his trip, paranoia, claustrophobia, schizophrenia, generic madness. Mm -hmm. But he made it. And despite the horrors of his entombed escape, remained sane and was given the nickname Box by the people who uncrated him. Whenever I read, hear, or think about the human being's unquenchable this thirst to be free, Henry Box Brown comes to my mind. He personifies the heroic impulse that makes by any means necessary more than a threatening slogan. And that's where that ends for this evening's reading. Well, thank you I'm for those late, two readings. But I hope you'll forgive me. And thank you for those two readings. And uh, Your website is www.odiehawkins.com. Appreciate that. Okay. And... Uh, Looking forward to your next two books, which are around the corner. Are we talking about the Quadrant Ball? The Quadrant Ball, and oh. with, with Bright Moments. With and, Bright Moments, oh. And The Report. Oh, me too. Okay, okay, me and too. The Report, so. Oh, well. That's it for the moment. Thank you. For this moment. For this in moment time. in time. Okay. It. Miss. Yes.